Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started on uh, our last two set of talks, which are going to be um, given together on thread-based parallelism uh, with Jeff and Jameson. All right, so you heard Paul Peterson from Intel say in the, during the first session that uh, we've, there's a 1.3 alpha version, and that is accurate. So we have just tagged uh, a pre-release uh, early 1.3 alpha, and there are actually now special binaries available on the download page uh, as well. And there is, I just now published a blog post explaining this as well on the julialang.org blog. Uh, so you can check that out and link people to it and you know tweet it if you like and all of that uh, where we are doing the first release of our new task parallelism uh, in Julia, uh, which is going to really open up a lot of exciting multi-threaded performance opportunities. Uh, Jameson and I and several other people uh, in the developer community, uh, as well as Kiran Pamnani, uh, Anton Malakov, as uh, Paul Peterson said uh, from Intel, uh, who worked with us on this. Uh, we've been working on it for a couple years, really, depending on how you want to count. Uh, we have, if you've seen the pull requests coming in, we have been uh, making everything thread safe to the extent we can. Uh, we, we might still be, have some issues to work through, but we've, we've gone through everything we can, we can possibly find uh, and reasonably make thread safe. Uh, we have put in a whole new scheduler. Uh, we have hooked up I.O. and our task system to multiple threads, and now this is basically ready to go. Uh, and Jameson is going to tell you a bit about uh, how it works and uh, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, where do we need to stand for this? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, we have a lot of work done. Um, we had some capabilities of doing parallel code before. Um, I have a little windmill here you know, ordering all of the little blocks going along. Uh, we had some atomics that you could kind of try out and test out, and we had some stuff buried in the experimental module. Um, and we also supported a few other things like process managed, um, multi computer distributed memory models of things, and cooperative share of um, cooperative model multitasking. But now we're ready to uh, release threading. It's still experimental. We're getting it into the alpha so people can try it out, play with it, um, figure out what the problems are. And uh, I'll talk in the next slide a little bit about where we're going in the future. Uh, but right now, I want to talk about bringing us into the atomic age here. Um, all of these computers now can talk together and do multiple tasks at the same time as Did you the make all these drawings? yes that is, that is really <laughs> I was drawing all these this morning uh, <laughs> I, I don't I don't think I knew that was among your talents that is, that is amazing <laughs> um, and so uh, what was it <laughs> um, right so we want to make it possible that as as we heard this morning um, we're running out of uh, tricks for the hardware to do to give us better single-threaded performance. Uh, so we need the ability for the processor just to do multiple things at the same time. So one of the ways we've gone about doing that is just try to make uh, a lot of the base primitives provided by Julia just thread safe by default. So if you were using a channel before, the API is almost the same. We've added the ability to lock and unlock them, although it's uh, typically optional. Um, they will lock and unlock as needed. Uh, so we try to make it so that you can get some level of thread safety by default. Of course, we can't help you with race conditions. There is no language that can do that. Um, you're still responsible for your own algorithms. But we want to make it possible to do I.O. Um, from threads. Uh, try to hook up the thread sanitizer so you can find the race conditions when you do accidentally introduce them, as we always know bugs are inevitable. And, um, and we just made it 1.0 release binaries are up, um, or we're going to be up soon. What's coming? Uh, well, we've done a lot of work. We still have a lot of things that we're interested in doing. Uh, some of these are performance improvements where we've tried to do the simple thing, make sure it works, and then worry about uh, how to micro-optimize it later. So we want to get the algorithms right, but then worry about how to make it fast later. We've wanted to um, just provide a bigger set of atomic operations. We provide a few basic ones again, make sure it works, let people try it out, and then we want to really make the API bigger so that um, there's a bigger set of standard library things, so we're hoping the community um, 
we'll get behind that. We've had like data structures package where Julia had a couple things in it and data structures just exploded that to have all of the other possibilities. We want that for threading and so we're um, probably will work on that some and just expecting that um, other people will jump in that we had no idea we were gonna jump in. Uh, and then the next step will also be then just using it more places internally. So one of the things that this new threading model should do really well is compose. And so if you have threading code that calls other threading code, they won't fight each other for the use of the CPUs. They'll try to schedule each other efficiently so that one task gets its chunk of CPU and gets its work done and then another job can start and use its part of the CPU and everything will get efficiently scheduled. If you're interested in that, um, you can look for Kieran Pomney's talks. Uh, what's the last time he gave it? I would just say on YouTube. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where, which venues he gave it in. Um, so without further ado, some examples here. Uh, you want to talk about the first one? Uh, so th this, is, uh, this is everybody's favorite multi-threaded program, uh, as far as I can tell. <laughs> So, uh, so for, for many years, so we've had this at threads loop for quite a while. So actually many people have been using threads in Julia already. So this is, this is not such a huge announcement from many people's perspective. Uh, but this uh, at threads loop had a lot of limitations and among them was that you couldn't use IO in them uh, because the way our IO works with, uh, it involves this uh, task switching mechanism that was not compatible with the way threading worked. Uh, so people would try to write this very program because this is everyone's favorite multi-threaded program. Uh, so people would try to write it and it wouldn't work and they would file an issue and that happened several times. I didn't, I didn't count how many times that issue was filed, but it, it was a few. So, well, we, we knew about that, but now it, now it really works uh, and you can do, uh, so printing, of course, and you can also do sockets, files, everything uh, will now work with threads. And here we see, uh, you know, you can see there's just some random, uh, you know, non-deterministic schedule of what, what thread gets what, uh, what order they run in. And so you can also see, uh, if you look closely, that this is a static schedule. So thread one always handles one and then two. Thread two handles two, uh, three and then four. And the schedule, I have eight threads, 12 work items. So then there's some uh, leftovers at the end that don't get handed. Uh, so threads only have to do one item. Um, but so you can see there's some uh, ordering here that is forced by the schedule. Well, it didn't take many lines of code to change here. We, we dropped the at threads, we replaced it with an at sync, um, and then we marked each portion of work that can be um, done in parallel, and now we have a fully generic schedule here, so there's no requirement that any particular thread handles any particular number in any particular order, and uh, it's just kind of chaos. Uh, I guess you could say that uh, you know that one through eight must be handled must be started before the next ones, and you could try to say, well, you at least maybe have some of that. Actually, no, I don't think that's true. I think they really could just go in any order. Yes, I think so, yeah. Um, so uh, the 50th anniversary of the Apollo here, would take off with this uh, and do some parallel sorting. Um, so if you're familiar with merge sort, um, the way the algorithm works is you just take two elements and you compare them and you figure out which one's bigger. And then you take two blocks of arrays and you sort them into each other um, and just recursively build up that piece. In Julia, now with this threading API, it takes this little bit of work here. We just had to add threads.spawn around the first part to sort these in parallel. And then remember, this is, piece sort is the same function here. So we're going to recurse in and launch another thread. And how many threads we launch is just purely dependent on how big the array was and how small we stop dividing it up. And then we just let the runtime worry about how do you schedule that efficiently? We don't want to worry about like, oh, I only have eight threads on my system, so I'm going to make sure that I only spawn eight threads because then it'll be over. Um, and here uh, I was doing the um, non-mutating API for sort. If you look at the blog post, there's a faster version that does the mutating API and talks through how to make that even faster. Uh, so, but here we launch a P sort and then we can just fetch the result back. We don't need any extra communication channels. We don't even, we don't need any mutation to do that. Uh, and then standard merge algorithm, pretty 
textbook and return the output from that. So P sorted this fairly large array on one second. Uh, it takes one second on uh, four threads. This is a four core, four hardware core machine that I was running on. How does that do? Well, that puts us up about here. So relative to single thread performance, we actually do see uh, two, two and a half percent speed up. Uh, so that was quite fun to see. Two Always and good. When two, two and a half, half X. X. Speed up. Uh, two and a half X speed up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, so look at other algorithms we've got here. A, uh, this is a classic algorithm from a, a very old paper, 1978 work on uh, some initial design work trying to say, how could you use threads well? Uh, say, this was looking at then um, an inspiration for the Go language. And so we're looking at, well, how does that work in Julia? We've got channels too. And we've now got the ability to just spawn tasks and do that work. So if you're familiar with the sieve of Eretzstasi, uh, something, yeah. Eretzstasthenes. You can see I didn't bother writing it on the slide. It was uh, not a name I'm used very much. Um, so this sieve works in parallel in that we've got a feeder process down here that's going to put in all of the odd numbers. And then we've spawned n threads, where n is the number of prime numbers that we want to get out of this algorithm. And we have the first thread will get that first number from our first process and say, OK, that must be prime. It was passed to me. It's the first time it was passed. Uh, and it says, that's prime. And then it, for every future number it looks and it gets, uh, it'll decide whether it should pass that on, or it might see that it's a uh, multiple of its prime number, and we'll filter that out, and it won't pass that on. So we pass 3, 5, 7, 11, eventually we get up to 15, 21, 25. You can see uh, the 3 passed it on, but our second prime number, when we um, created that second prime number, the thread that was handling the second prime number filter, and said, no, 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 that's not a prime number, and it did not pass that on. So over time, we just collect all of the, the prime numbers, that way, not the most efficient way of doing it, if you're wondering. There's a primes.jl package that is much faster than this and uses some better tricks. But just using the fairly naive algorithm here, we do actually see some incredible speed up. So on four threads, this took about two seconds. On one thread, this took about 14 seconds. So that's a six and a half x speed up uh, over four th threads. Um, or actually super linear, uh, which we say is usually, it's pretty rare in the threading world that uh, you can have an algorithm that we'd say it's so bad that it actually gets super linear speed up uh, <laughs> because there's just that much overhead in trying to compute primes this way. Uh, and when you have the, uh, the ability to do some operations in bulk, the, uh, it runs a little bit faster. <laughs> Um, and then the last one we have today is uh, another classic algorithm, the prefix scan. In this case, uh, you start with an array, say, of all ones, and you want to output an array that is the sum of all the elements before that element. And so if you had an array of all ones, then we get an array of the uh, numbers um, in a range. Uh, if you do this the fairly straightforward way, the first number takes the previous sum and adds it to itself, that ends up taking order n steps. Uh, so the longest dependency chain in that is n steps. Uh, and, and additionally, we took four additions to do it. Uh, when we reorder this algorithm a little bit, we can keep uh, about the same number of additions, but we can uh, observe that not all of these operations need to wait for the previous operation. And I hope I drew most of my arrows in the right place here. Uh, I didn't check. Uh, I was running out of time this morning. But so if you combine a couple numbers here, you could potentially do those sums in parallel. And then uh, on the next step, there wasn't any parallelism because I didn't have a big enough array. And then uh, you combine some more numbers, and eventually you get the same result at the bottom. But now, if you look across this diagonal, it only took us 
uh, three, three, the longest dependency chain was uh, three there. Uh, so if you're able to actually execute these sums in parallel, the total time can be reduced, uh, even though the amount of work you had to do was about the same, because you do have to add, actually add up the numbers at some point. Um, and this one also gives us scaling uh, that looks pretty similar to our p-sort scaling. It perhaps drops off a little bit sooner, so maybe uh, later on it would not continue scaling as well. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to thank our sponsors that helped us um, do this work and paid for some of it, uh, helping us get it out and take any questions. Please come up to the microphone if you want to ask a question. We, and, and okay, sure. If you want to say it loudly and then please repeat the question. Ah, so the question was, how does this relate to the work on Parter? So Parter was a uh, scheduler and algorithm that Kiran uh, Pamnani uh, came up with and designed. Uh, and he actually has a standalone uh, repository on GitHub that just has that scheduler. Uh, and then as part of this work, we took that and grafted it into the Julia runtime. And so we are using his algorithm in there now as, uh, to, to implement the, the shared scheduling queue. Yeah, yeah, we are, we are running tasks uh, on, on, on the threads now. Yeah, yeah, so, so for instance, in, uh, in the prime sieve example, we, we spawn one task per number that you want to, to compute. Okay. So, and then, and, then the, and then the tasks get scheduled onto however many processor cores you have. Uh, so you can, uh, so the idea is to, you know, you can really expose all of the available parallelism potentially. Uh, of course, they have some overhead, so you don't you don't want a task you know per scalar or something usually, um, but so that there is some overhead. But you can expose a really massive amount of parallelism. You can you can spawn millions of tasks, and it, it works fine. Uh, and and we'll just and the system takes care of scheduling that on, onto however many hardware threads you actually have. Yeah. So in this case, all of these uh, this at spawn is just returning a task, the same sort of task that you had before. It flips one bit in it though. Uh, which is somewhat exposed. It's uh, the dot sticky flag, which says, uh, should I schedule this on the current thread and give you a cooperative multitasking, a little bit easier to reason about, or should I just put it into the multi-queue uh, multi scheduler and let any task run it? So in this case, as you can see, any tasks runs it. Uh, in the future, the part tier work has some priority work that will give it additional performance benefits that's not running here. So I think this piece sort may even be faster in the future. Uh, this may be a good example case to show when the Partier algorithm is really um, uh, running optimized. Uh, right now we're, we're not, we've turned off some of the optimizations that is the main reason to have it. Yeah, this is ongoing work on the scheduler details. Uh, yeah. So does the scheduler get dynam like dynamically choose which tasks are going to go where every single time you run the code, or does that get compiled and the schedule Ah, yes. So the question is: Is the schedule dynamic? And yes, it's dynamic. So every, every time a task uh, blocks for some reason to, to wait for I/O or to wait for another task, uh, we, we will dynamically you know, at that time pick another task to run. So it, it's dynamically scheduled. Yeah. You said millions of tasks. Have you tested that? Yes. Yeah, we've te we've tested. We, uh, oh, the, the, the question is, I said millions of tasks, have we tested it? Yes. Yeah, so I, I have, uh, for instance, in the blog post, we have the recursive uh, Fibonacci uh, example where I, you can go up to, you know, powers in the 30s, so that will even spawn a billion tasks. And you can try it now by downloading 1.2. Yeah, and you can yes. yeah, try it, and actually please, you know, please try it and, uh, you know, do your worst and let us know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a hand back there. Have we have we thought about alternative threading models? Uh, well, I mean, it's a it, so there are some design details remaining here. There are there are different subtle things you can do uh, with with the structure of how the tasks are spawned and waited for and so on, which we're still uh, considering. And so that might evolve a little bit. 
Uh, but as far as other, as far as very different threading models, uh, we think this is really the right one because it's very composable. Uh, you can uh, you can call library functions that use parallelism on on every level, and it composes without oversubscribing CPUs. So it's, in a language like this, I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Ah, so is there a remaining reason to use uh, distributed instead of threads? Uh, I think uh, there, there, there still would be reasons, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. we'd say yes. Yes, there, there are definitely <laughs> still reasons. Uh, so, you know, like my, my laptop has two cores, so if I need a thousand cores, <laughs> I'm going to have to do something else. Uh, and you can't, you can't buy a thousand core machine in, with shared memory, as far as I know. Uh, so you're still going to need distributed for a very, very big scale. Uh, and there are also cases where uh, it might be difficult to make your program thread safe, but you can immediately run it with distributed parallelism. So it can also uh, can also be easier to get things working distributed sometimes. Yeah, sometimes mm. the the option of having shared memory that threads gives you is actually a curse. It's, it can be harder to manage. It can actually be a little bit slower uh, because you are trying to manage a shared resource, and that can be more expensive. So the distributed may, in some cases, be faster if your program is amenable to it, plus the option that you can run on a different machine. Uh, got a lot of hands. Yeah. Oh, oh someone came to the mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Preference for the mic. He's doing it properly. So yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that um, I.O. is now safe and all of that. Could you talk maybe a little bit more at the low level how that works? I'm, a lot. I'm thinking specifically in the case of like the HTTP server. Right now we, you know, do an async for a task for every incoming connection. Is all of that pushed to one thread, or is it somehow shared at the libuv level between things? Just yeah, wondering so, how that can all play out. Right. So, so one thread uh, runs the event loop. It, it can be different threads, so the event loop can hop around to but one thread at a time. Uh, and you can have, uh, you can be doing parts of the of of the work in, in an application like that on all of the threads, certainly. But there is a there's currently a lock to get into libuv to add new I/O requests. Uh, so. That's that's an area we will we'll look at if, if we need to do anything different to get much better performance. But that's a that's a good case to try and you know let us know what happens. Will do. Yeah, we're kind of surprised to see there was actually some scaling observed, even though everything is locked. The the overhead of just doing stuff outside the lock actually sometimes gives you better yeah, results. There, ten, there tends to be some you know some work managing buffers or setting up requests and stuff which can still be parallelized so you know not a lot of work happens in, in the actual act of queuing the IO request so uh, there's still enough work often outside that you get some scaling. But. So how does it play this is a question related to the distributor the year before uh, how does it play within a PMAP loop something like it doesn't approach exclude each other or something that can play well together? They will work together. Yeah, they're totally orthogonal. So you could uh, PMAP works in distributed memory, and then on each processor, it could be doing something with multiple threads. So you can definitely combine them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, my question is: Will this? Uh, sorry. So you, you said you have a scheduler. Uh, will this scheduler potentially incorporate priorities for the tasks that you already want to schedule, or is that? Ah, uh, yeah. So so it uh, it does. So Kiran's algorithm does actually use a priority heap. Oh, okay. So it, ha it has the possibility so for priorities, priority and actually, as of as of actually today, every task has the same priority. Okay. <laughs> so it's just working as a queue, uh, okay. but it but it has that uh, ability. So that's that's something we're going to be experimenting with. Yeah. Uh, has anything changed with respect to the integration with Blas and the threading that Blas gives natively? Uh, the question is about uh, what do you do about Blas native threads? Very good question. Uh, so right now, we don't really have a great answer for that. Uh, I would, if, if you want to use it today and you want to do matrix multiply on multiple threads, you'll probably have to set the number of blast threads to one, uh, or else it actually will oversubscribe. So that, that's something we have to work on a bit. And of course, the, the obvious solution is to write blast in Julia, and then everything will just work. <laughs> All right, I hope this isn't a terribly unpopular decision, but I think any remaining questions, which I'm sure there are more, should be taken offline so that everyone can go to lunch. So let's once again thank our speakers. Thank